All right, welcome back to another classroom setting. And of course, I have my patent attorney, it's mine, my patent and trademark attorney extraordinaire, Ms. Shantavia Johnson. You can follow her at Shantavia, S-H-O-N-T-A-V-I-A dot com. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate you. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, you know, it's important that we, uh, as we talk about this, uh, excavate our ancestors and tell their stories. And, you know, we, we of course, if, if invention, if necessity is the mother of invention, we know that Black folk probably were some of the greatest inventors of all time, particularly in the, in the new world. And um, so today you're going to tell us about one of the first Black women to hold a patent. One of the first Black women to own a patent, that's right. Her name was Sarah Good, G-O-O-D-E. She was born in 1855 in Toledo, Ohio. And one of the interesting things about Sarah Good is that she was born the same year that the Fugitive Slave Act was enacted. So she was born into slavery. Tell people what that, what is. The, the Fugitive Slave Act is where, um, before that, if a person ran away, they could find freedom up north. Right? right. So in the South, you could find freedom up north or in the, in the West where there wasn't a slave state. But the Fugitive Slave Act changed the game. That's right. The Fugitive Slave Act essentially said if you made it to freedom and someone caught you, you could be returned back into slavery. And this was particularly important in Ohio, of course, because it bordered the South and the free states in the Midwest. So she was born into that. She was born into that, and after slavery ended 10 years later, her family moved further west. They moved to Chicago, Illinois. She was born into a family of furniture makers. She married a furniture maker, and they created a great life. They created a furniture store, and they were a successful furniture store, so successful, in fact, that people would come in, and they would tell them, hey, we're having these problems. Can you help us? And so she, through her customers, learned that when all these black people moved to Chicago, they were in these very small spaces and they didn't have a lot of room. So what Sarah Good invented was essentially the precursor to the Murphy bed, the bed that falls away into the wall. And so she invented that so that people who were her customers would have more space at home. So she created this invention out of necessity. What year was this? This is 1885. Okay, and so, so slavery ended 1865, most places except for te uh, Houston, Texas, except for Texas, Dallas, mm -hmm. uh, to be exact. And people, there was a first migration, because people talk about the great mi migration of the early 1900s, and then there was another one later on. But that first migration were people leaving the plantations, not wanting to do that, with the dangling of opportunity up north and in the Midwest, uh, of industrious work, right? And so she was part of that. And the, the folks flooding into these tight, which they call ghettos, mm -hmm. cramming millions of people into several square bl blocks. Mm -hmm. I, I know this, my dad grew up in Newark and he talks about growing up and living in a, in a building, actually it's on a floor with four other families. He's one of eight. So they literally took a building, took maybe a one bedroom apartment and had a family that had six kids live in that one bedroom. They wow. shared the bathroom down the hall. Four families, each of them had six, seven, and eight kids each on one. I mean, imagine that. Imagine the, imagine how horrific that is, the conditions, you know. A lot mm -hmm. of Black people died during that time of disease and, and other things because they were so crammed into these spaces. And you imagine now you have you have no room to, to eat. You have no room to do anything. So that Murphy bed was freaking brilliant. Oh, it was. And her bed could be folded up. It could look like a desk. There was room for storage. So she created like a three-in-one piece of furniture for Black people who had recently migrated to Chicago. Mm. Okay. What patent number was that? So she was an early patent inventor. Her patent number was 322177. And what that means is that th that's the number of patent that was issued in the United States at that time. So now we're in the 10, 11 million patent mark. She was 332177. So she was an early patent inventor in the United, or an early inventor in the United States and was actually pretty rare at that time. There were only, at that point, five to seven other black women who had ever received a patent in the United States. So she was a very rare company. What did that, what value did that hold? 
Because I, I think about to this day, you know, you, you create something, mm -hmm. you go and you sell it. Mm -hmm. right? She could have sold the furniture without a patent, right? What she could have. For her? So what the patent does is give you a monopoly. It allows you to be the sole source of that thing that you've invented. Now you can license it to a big company who's willing to make a lot and produce a lot and give you a licensing fee, or you can make it and sell it yourself. And if people want that thing, they have to come get it from you. So it was very valuable. Now the challenge for black women during that time was that white people might not buy from black folks. So if you had, you know, a good base of people, a good base of black people, they could buy from you. But if your market depended on white people spending money with you in many cities, that was next to impossible. Well, um, I think about George F. Grant, the inventor of the golf tee, you mm -hmm. know, like, so I think the challenge is, I don't know, I, I think a lot of people might have bought Sarah Good's Murphy bed, white people, because Mm -hmm. White people were cramming in, immigrants were coming in as well from Germany and from Ireland into that same uh, space of Chicago. And those apartments were small for them as well. Right. And so not a lot is known about what happened at, to force Sarah Good afterward, but her family continued to operate the furniture store. So they probably were a little bit better off. Other Black women inventors, though, didn't fare so well. So there actually is at least one story of a Black woman who got a patent around that same time in 1890. And she didn't make a dime, even though her product was really, really financially successful. Lots of people bought it. She invented a clothes wringer. So a thing when people wash clothes to, to get all the water out of the clothes. She ended up selling her rights in the invention because white people wouldn't buy from her. But when she sold her rights to a white, uh, a white company, it was a financial success. The challenge, though, is to be ever vigilant. No, I mean, you know, with these things, they can be infuriating, but they also kind of tell you something about the fortitude of people who came before us. And it didn't mm -hmm. stop them from inventing. It didn't stop them from keep, you know, the, keep pressing forward. Um, we're going to be, be talking about a lot of these people in future series, but I just want to thank you again. You got anything last to say about Sarah Good before we sign off? Well, I think just the lesson from Sarah Good is to own your intellectual property. When you are inventing things, whether they're around the house or because people tell you they have a problem and you have a solution, own that intellectual property. Don't give it to history. Don't give it to some other person who's not as smart as you, not as enterprising as you. Own your intellectual property and exploit it. What's the easiest way to do that? Where, where can people go to get to, to patent something or to get something traded? Mm -hmm. So the most viable option, unless you are willing to do a ton of background research and education and learning and everything else, is to hire a good patent lawyer or get a good patent lawyer. One of the places, though, that very few people know about where you can get a great patent lawyer basically for free is through law schools in your state. So many law schools around the United States have what are called legal clinics. And the United States Patent and Trademark Office has given power to many legal clinics around the country to represent inventors for free or for very, very, very reduced cost. And in the legal clinic, the law student files a patent application for you with the help of a licensed attorney. And so the average cost of a patent application in the United States right now is around seven to maybe $9,000. So you're talking about getting a patent basically for a few hundred dollars, the cost of filing the application versus thousands and thousands of dollars. So use that resource, use the law school legal clinics that have that permission from the Patent and Trademark Office. And the difference between a patent and a trademark. So the patent protects your invention. So the thing that you've created, that widget, that chair, that whatever that you've built or created and designed, the trademark protects the way that you are connecting with consumers and distinguishing your products and services from other people. And so that's just a fancy way of saying how people know your product is yours and somebody else's product is somebody else's. So it's the difference between the Nike check and the Adidas three bars, or the difference between the Apple logo and uh, I don't know, whatever other oh. kind of laptop, Dell or whatever, that laptop. Okay.
Uh, so you can go to your local law school or you can go to Shantavia. I'm going to do that. Shantavia.com because you actually specialize in helping people form their businesses and take care of all of their intellectual property. That's your business. That's what you do. That's exactly right. I, I have an academy, the Branded Business Academy, where I help people start businesses with an eye toward their intellectual property. And if you visit my website at shantavia.com, that's S-H-O-N-T-A-V-I-A.com, I include a whole database of the law schools that do this kind of work for people and suggestions about where you can find a lawyer if you don't qualify for that help from a law school. I love that. Look at that. Well, let me thank you again for your service and I, and I thank you for your passion regarding this because I think it is super important for us to not just remember the folks that have come before us, but be inspired by them. And Sarah Good and her Murphy bed, Sarah Good, G-O-O-D-E. Let's not ever forget her name. And Shantavia, let me thank you. We won't forget your name either. And thank you, Karen, for educating and inspiring people to continue down this path. It is such important work, and I'm so grateful for you to do that, for doing that. My absolute pleasure. Oh, subscribe to this channel, by the way. Subscribe, subscribe, and share it, and give it to people, and let's grow this, uh, this family of knowledge gatherers and seekers, and uh, we'll see y'all next time. Thank you, Shantavia. Thank you very much.